um, this woman, if you take it down even a little deeper into the mind, I call it ontological guilt. The ontological guilt is the belief that you could split your mind apart from God. That's such a horrific idea that it's like the mind was like, oh my God, what have I done? Ripped myself apart, away from my Creator. It was too overwhelming that time was made up to dilute the guilt and to splinter it off into tiny little specks over how many, how, how, about, how can, can I dilute this? Uh, I need a, a thousand years. No, let's make it ten thousand. No, let's make it a million. <laughs> no, if I spread it over over so many million, billion years, now that'll be good. I'll just have a little splinter here and there, you see. It's almost like I use the example, if somebody came to you and they said, okay, here, here's a little cup of the, the most deadly poison. Uh, that there's no more deadly, no more poisonous than the venom from a poisonous snake or uh, a scorpion. There's the most here a little cup here of poison, and you have to drink the cup. It's like some Shakespeare. You have to drink the cup. But I'll give grant you one wish. You can you can do whatever you want to this poison, but you have to drink the poison. So uh, okay, I'll grant you one wish. You know you, you're not you're not allowed to to eliminate the poison, but you can do whatever you else want with the poison. So, it would be like saying, okay, so I have to drink the poison. Okay, okay, I'm going to mix the poison. I'm going to take a walk over to the beach here. <laughs> and just, I'll throw it in, mix it around, come back a few days later with my cup. <laughs> Let the tide go in and out, and this and this and this. Okay, I'm ready. I get my cup. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Ready to have my cup of poison. Is that okay? Okay, yes, you've fulfilled the rules. You can drink it now. It's a little bit diluted. <laughs> you know, diluted because it got mixed in with the ocean. But imagine the ocean is like time. Time and space. So that's the ego's trick. Yeah, it's, it's, no, the trick is it's diluted so that you just get a small proportion of the poison because you still have to drink it. So, so the ego has taken guilt, this ontological guilt over, oh my God, I separated from God. It did the one most horrific thing you could ever do to try to kill God or to try to rip your mind apart from the Creator, which is what I call ontological guilt, and then it splintered and diluted the guilt into all kinds of scenarios. The scenario you just described, it's a little boy crying in the rain. When you come back, Mommy, you didn't see me, you left me here. You know, that's a little teeny scene out of all the scenes in history. And it's a little, or, oh my gosh, my, my son fell off the grandstand. And if I only had been there to prevent it, or if I only had, could have been more attentive, or whatever it is. You see, this is the trick of the world. It tries to splinter and dilute the guilt in time, and there's no solution to it. It's, it's not, it has nothing about correction there. You know, still taking the poison, except taking a smaller dose of the poison. And so, time seems to be, you relive these hurts over and over. That one stands out, you know, taking the apple on the tongue lashing stands out. But underneath that, that tongue lashing, and underneath that taking of the apple, is this ontological thing. So, for example, the ego is like a spider that's down a deep well. And if you take a flashlight and you go down and shine the light down in the well, the spider will simply move <laughs> away from the light to go hide in the dark. And you move the light and the spider moves. And you keep moving the light and the spider keeps moving. It's hiding. It doesn't want... What will happen if if the light shines right on the spider? It's exposed as just a lie. So in one sense that's what you're doing now with the course. You've got this huge spotlight. <laughs> and you bring it over to the well and you turn the light on and then the spider is like it's just shown to be just a tiny spider, not this wicked, deep, evil thing, just a tiny little spider. So that's what we're doing here when we keep going through these healing exercises. All you're doing is you're starting to see that this, this, 
this little spider, kind of this little teeny puff in your mind, is really not such a big bad thing. In fact, it's unreal. When you expose it to the light, you see that you can't really separate from your Creator. You can't do it. And that's good news, that you really, really are innocent, that you really didn't have the power to do something wrong. So the healing is the awareness. Lifting into awareness. Allowing it to come up, like you both have done here. It's emotional. You can still feel the emotion of it come up, but in, in opening it up and in, in, in exposing it, that's, that's precisely how it's healed. I just like to thank Bill and Jenny. When, when you allow for it to come up, do you have to do that in, with somebody else present, or can you do it yourself in private and yeah. hand it over? And yeah, you can do it by yourself. You can do it, I did it with music and movies. I would put various pieces of music on and let the emotion, the tears come up. And certainly watching a lot of movies, I, I just, it was like a geyser, like so many tears. But like a waterfall, like like the waterfall, you, you would never be able to turn it off if you turned it on. And I think that's that's a big aspect of what the spiritual journey is about, is you, you really have to open to guidance and allow yourself permission to let that hurt rise. As you see, Margaret, just in what you shared, it just brought up this huge amount of emotion. And, and in a context, again, of safety, whether it's with people where you feel a sense of love and trust, or going off to a place, you know, just a room in your house, or I went to movie theaters and would just let all these emotions come up while I was watching the movies. Then I would go out and sit in my car or drive to a park, have a good long cry, have a close friend that, that you're working with, you know, where you can just go and cry and cry and cry and be held by them. We were talking about this morning, you were saying there's still feelings of like rejection, deep feelings of rejection, that once you start to get in touch with them, they seem so intense that you wonder, how, how will I keep it together? Uh, I could be uh, taken over by these feelings, and that's definitely how it feels sometimes, because the feelings are so intense so, that you have to move through them. I did it with my dog. <laughs> So once we identify the guilt, that's part of the healing, I still haven't quite got, like, what's the next step? I haven't, I've missed something somewhere, but my story is a lot of stories, but I won't dwell on it, but like a special needs son, and I, all my life I felt guilty, one, because in the end I didn't cope, two, because then he had to um, get into supportive care. Then I felt responsible, the mother role, for needing to be there. Not needing to be needed, I looked at them and did that one too. Yeah. But now I'm feeling guilty about actually giving myself permission to be happy. I didn't realise that's what I was doing. And yes, I feel guilty that I don't want to have him every second week. And I actually don't want to have him around all the time anymore. He's 25. So then I get guilty about that. The good thing is I can now talk about that, so I've kind of moved a long way, and I love him, but I'm actually loving myself more now. Yeah. Am I, am I making sense? Yes, exactly. It, you're looking for, for where's, the, where's the release point. And it's like, if you just take the snapshot of the Course in Miracles workbook lessons, it starts out with number one, and Jesus goes number one, then two, three, four, five, six. And he says, the reason the first six are true is because of number seven. And the reason number seven is true is because of number eight. And you just follow him. Here's the master psychologist, the, the one who actually really knows what healing is. Not hypothetically, not theorizing, but this is Jesus Christ, the master, the Lord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You go through all these less workbook lessons, and then, bingo, you hit number 23. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. 
Now he's making a direct escape route. He's been building his tunnel. Building his tunnel. With number 1, 2, 3, 4, going through, build through 10, 12, 14, build, build, build. But when you get to 23, I can escape from the world I see. Remember, the ego made this world. This projected world with all of its distorted images and everything is hell. You don't have to worry about an eternal hell burning in a fiery brimstone hell and everything. This projected world is the hell. And the stuff that you've gone through and the memories you remember in your life, that's been the hell and the hurt and the pain. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. What are the attack thoughts? The private thoughts that we've been talking about. All those thoughts we got, we saw expressed in the movie, you know, all the, the issues and thoughts we're talking about, those are the private thoughts that are making the hell. And the only escape from them is, is to give them up. Give them over to the Holy Spirit. How do you give a thought over to the Holy Spirit? Simply by not protecting it, you know. That's what repression and denial are about, is pushing them out of awareness. Like saying, they're so horrific, they're so bad, they're so dark, I don't want to think these anymore. You've heard of people who have gone through like child abuse memories and whatever, that they blanked out. The memories were so horrific, they blanked them out of mind. Well, that's what denial and repression is. And it's not sometimes till later in their life when suddenly something triggers something and they have this memory. Or maybe people that have fought in one of the world wars, or the Korean War, or the Vietnam War, all of a sudden they've blanked out some horrific scene of shooting and then going, shooting in this tent or this house and walking in and finding a bunch of dead babies and children. They've just done the most horrific thing. Versus like stealing an apple, they've actually shot out of fear, and they walk in and they find that there's these dead children in there, you know, it's, and then they got this memory now to live with. How do you forgive it? You have to start to realize that this is a mind training program of starting to realize that you have to be convinced that these private thoughts are not real. God didn't create them. This has all been a nightmare. It's been made up, but you have to start to really see the unreality of the nightmare. That's the only escape the only way to peace of mind. So that's why I, when people say, you know, I'm working with the Course, I say, if you really just give yourself over to the Course, to the learning it, to working with those lessons, the workbook lessons are like the laboratory. You know, even when you're in science class, you have to read the text to help make the experiment meaningful. Sometimes if you don't read the text, you, you're clueless <laughs> when you're in the laboratory. But if you really work with the text, it just makes the laboratory meaningful, but but it's all about releasing the thoughts and not protecting them. And you actually become quite good at it, you know. At first it seems kind of, what am I doing, how is this going to work and everything, but you actually do get quite good at not protecting the thoughts anymore. You have a good cry, you, you journal. You do what you do. You do experiential exercises. I know people, like our friend Caroline has done theater and do dance. You can do, do all kinds of different techniques as you're guided, but it's a way of releasing these thoughts. I had experienced that being a trainee for lifetimes. You, we had to go through this enormous process of self-awareness. And I thought I was quite spiritual up there. But the training just showed me so much awareness that it was unbelievable. And I think I was guided definitely to go to Lifeline to clean up a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I went into face to face counseling myself and managed to, to clean up heaps. Yeah. You could feel just, it. Yeah, just following yeah. that guidance. I just, it was just an enormous experience to get that you know, out of the yeah. system. And just it. loving it and yeah. accepting it. You can take any kind of memory, any kind of association. In the life of David, there was when, when I don't know how old I was, but it was, um, I had to go to the hospital for a tonsillectomy to have tonsil, tonsils taken out. It was like, ooh, eerie, eerie hospitals, operations, 
I've had, had an eerie feeling when I would go to funeral homes when I was young and look at these corpse, the corpse laying there. I thought, oh, what a strange ritual. I felt really weird going to funeral homes. But I had this weird thing about hospitals and doctors and blood. So I remember going in, they take me into the hospital for the tonsillectomy, and they, part of the intake is they have to take a sample of your blood. So they had these tiny little vials, and they would actually puncture the fingers. And I remember, oh, <laughs> and they had the smelling sauce, because it was like, there was this association of like, it's blood, it's, that's my blood. It was just like this thing. So I remember a few years past, it was like, uh, I had a hernia operation, back to the, this time, intake procedure, big bigger vials. They weren't the tiny little tubes. It was, I'm like horrified to see these big vials. It was like more, oh, oh. <laughs> they had to revive. So years pass. This is probably maybe my, in my 20s or something. Now, on my spiritual journey, doing meditation, working with all these different things. And this time, uh, my friend comes to me, who's in the spiritual life with me, and he says, um, there's a study where you can get paid, maybe we can get paid uh, for going, and we're both vegetarians, so we can go to the hospital and over a series of like two weeks, they will just take our blood uh, every, <laughs> like so many hours, it starts off like every maybe four or five, six hours, and then progressively as you go through the two weeks, they just take your blood more and more and more and more, and I thought, oh, I think I'm supposed to do this. So, I go there, and I'm darned to this study where they would come, and they'd have to come and take, find a vein, and take your blood. And I said, boy, this is going to be good practice. And I'm, I'm talking to the doctors and nurses in the place about metaphysics, and saying, you know, it's all in the mind. It's, there's no, nothing to do with the medical model one. They're all looking at me like I'm crazy, but I'm doing this thing, and it goes on and on, until finally near the end of the study, they have to come and they have to take the blood, and they're having trouble uh, uh, hitting, finding the, the vein and everything. So it gets down towards like the last day of the, of the study, and I'm in there working on my meditation, my metaphysics, and this young girl comes in who's very, very inexperienced and who <laughs> uh, has not had any experience with this. And this is like near the end of the study, where this, and she comes in and she's like really nervous, and I'm just looking at her, and she's getting nervous, and she goes, all right, I'm going to take your blood, and then, whack, 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 <laughs> you get to watch a body, an arm get whacked away at, <laughs> with a needle, or trying to do this, and she's, ah, ah, she's all, she runs away, <laughs> and I mean, finally they have to get like a doctor to come in to do the final one, and, and I'm sitting there going, hmm, this is for forgiveness. <laughs> I can see. I thought, this is really my forgiveness lesson. And so, the following day, this girl comes in and she's just, she can hardly walk in the door. She feels so guilty for what she thinks she's done. And I thought to myself, this is all for my healing, to just, to see past it all. And so when she came in, she was like, I'm so, it was, she couldn't apologize enough. I'm so sorry, I can just feel so good. I just said, come over, come here, come here, and I just gave her a big long hug and said, no, you didn't do anything wrong here. This was all for my lesson in letting go of fear and guilt. You did great! Oh, you played your part perfectly! <laughs> I did? Yes! <laughs> but you see how it you have to get to the point of starting to see that they, it's the fear and the guilt are not external. These were just fear thoughts. She was acting out my own fear thoughts around blood, taking blood, my blood, all these different concepts and thoughts. But then if the result is that she's now got guilt, then she'll now have to have a later lesson to get rid of that guilt that she felt around your lesson. So it's really just, it's, the whole world is a projection of, of thoughts. So there's really only one mind. It's not, it really wasn't my guilt and her guilt, or my lesson and her lesson. The, the one 
lesson is to let it go. When we really have to let go of these attack thoughts. And when we do, all the witnesses in our world change. Because they're all reflecting our thoughts in our minds. If people have a problem with Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden, guess who's, you know, it's just the guilt that has to be released from the mind. It's not like it's his guilt and her guilt and my guilt and their guilt. So it makes it much simpler. And that's why Jesus says in the Course, when, when I am healed, I am not healed alone. You know, that you really, when you do your inner work, you are literally healing the entire world. You're healing your children, you're healing Victor, Bill's healing his son. Everyone gets healed together when we release this guilt. Because we're all that connected. You know, it's all that connected. So it's, it gives you incentive. It's like, what greater gift could you give to everyone than to go for innocence, you know, than to go for true forgiveness? Because you release everyone. Well, Kirsten was making all the signals. <laughs> Becky's making all the signals. It's the lunchtime signal. Thank you for figuring that out. It's a way of... It's strange, I'm sorry I didn't turn the phone off. But it was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. oh, look, he it's rang. Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, no, no that's, that's showing the connection. Yeah. Here you weren't talking about it, and he yeah. rang you. Yeah. That actually got used. That's part of the parable. Yeah, the camera's still rolling. <laughs> Are you? That's, that's part of the connection. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, 
shelf and the publications and writings are here. Is everyone familiar with the movie guide? Yes. Yeah? Okay. It was just Margaret who hadn't seen that. These ones are new sets um, we've had made up. You may be familiar with some of the CDs, but each one has like a five disc set. Um, two, three audio CDs. Um, a music CD with music of Christ and a DVD in it. So um, if you want to know any more about any of the content of them, just come and ask and I can let you know. But these are, I sort of was asked to make them up for the trip to Australia and I've just picked like the best material that I really resonated with in terms of um, the quality and the content. Of them, so these are just really good sets. If you don't have any of the Awakening Mind materials, then these are really great. Are they, what, are, what are they, David? Talking like the groups? Or? Yeah, the audio CDs. Um, the first one, two. The first two are an interview of David with um, a couple, David Paul and Candice Doyle, who do a lot of workshops for helping people get in touch with hearing the Holy Spirit. And so it was a two-hour interview asking a lot of questions about what's it like to be the voice for the Holy Spirit and sort of his path and how that came to be. They have a large readership, so they basically ask the, ask the readership to send in questions. And then out of all those questions, they said, let's pick the best questions or the ones that we feel like we would most want to be answered. So that's what they asked those kind of enough. Mm. They had them all laid out for themselves and they just kind of answered, asked them one after the next. Yeah. It's really clear. Yeah, yeah. You can listen to it over and over. There's just so much in it. Um, Beyond the Yuck was um, it's a compilation of gatherings, that one. So again, just lots of questions that people were asking. Um, lots of laughter, I think. Yeah, lots of laughter. Yeah, the CDs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a three CD set, uh -huh. but I just put the first one in here. Mm -hmm. Um, and the DVD was in San Pedro. That's another DVD, just again, lots of laughter and um, great questions. It's nice to hear the witnesses. Like, I remember, oh yeah, San Pedro, I had a lot of fun with that one back in whatever, 2004. And recently we um, were contacted by this man, a friend of mine named Kelly Love, that uh, when Kirsten and Jason get back, they're going to be going to North Carolina to meet with Kelly and his group. It's the first Course in Miracles group in the history of mankind. <laughs> it was in North Carolina. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, uh, Judy Sketch went, went through there and they said, let's get a group. Let's have a study group. And so thus was the first Course in Miracles study group. So don't be going speaking to this ancient <laughs> group that started by know, how many <laughs> years ago. But anyway, Kelly, he was the first voice of the course. He was the first one to ask to record the, the course onto cassette tapes. So people who sometimes had problems with reading or just people who like to hear it more in an auditory way, he was the first one that, was, that recorded it. And, um, and apparently uh, he wrote or 
called, or I forget how, I think he went for it, said that, on the phone, said that basically, um, his wife, all these years he's been a Course in Miracles student, we were talking about when one's a student and the other isn't. Well, mm -hmm. here's Kelly, who was the original voice of the Course, who's been in the Course for many, many years, decades, and his wife is not a Course in Miracles student. And he said, they watched the San Pedro um, DVD together, she said, I think I want to study that book of yours. <laughs> all these years <laughs> watching that DVD, I said, well, thank you, that's, mm -hmm. that's very inspirational to know that it, <laughs> it got used in that way. So she's watched him for maybe 25 years or more, <laughs> and now this was like, okay, I think I'll... That was my pick. Yeah, yeah, I just picked one DVD to make the first set, and it was like, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, it's really inspiring. And all the uh, the angel music, Rista, who David mentioned, she she had over 200 songs come through, and I made up, um, I think, three or four different compilations with a theme. So this theme I just pulled from that 200 odd songs, just the songs that are just about God's love, changeless love. So it's a beautiful meditation. Oh, DVDs are that? It's a CD. It's a music CD. That's a, C that's yeah. a uh, DVD and that's a CD. Yeah. All right. So there's one DVD, a music CD, and three audio CDs, of David speaking. Mm -hmm. And then the second one that we just had um, made up with a very happy smile. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the first two, um, oh, that's the... The other music CD, I don't know which water they're in, Gentle Awakening, so those songs were all about waking up. Um, and this two CD set was the Atonement Talks, that was um, at the last Course in Miracles conference, the topic David spoke on was Atonement, so they're, they're great, it's all about... There's a metaphysical talk, yeah. and a transfer turning talk, so both pretty cool. Like, addresses everybody in the conference, if they have any particular block or whatever, it's like... Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. And you lead the first one off getting everyone to sing a song for everyone in the, in the conference. Yeah, I'm, the I'm the Holy Child, I'm the Holy Child of God in Heaven. <laughs> it's, a, it's a song that he wrote, I'm the Holy Child of God in Heaven, I'm the Holy Light that shines yes. always, walking through this world in perfect safety, from darkness and from fear I know I'll raise. And then the chorus is, I'm so happy. <laughs> Imagine, 500, <laughs> or I don't know how many it was, two or three hundred hours when we had there harmonizing. I'm so happy. After they're singing, I'm the holy child of God in heaven. They sang it from the top of their lungs. So. They love it. Yeah, they loved it. Kind of got a little bit of a bebop, hip hop, rap beat to it, and a little bit of this oriental thing in there. Really, quite a fascinating song. Yeah, we can play it for everybody. Yeah. That might be a nice way to start our session. <laughs> yeah. Yes, after Kristen finishes her Holy Spirit spiel. Holy Spirit spiel. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's also that one too, the atonement talks. Yeah. Like there's tons of great parables of like, that are just perfectly applicable to, you know, how we, how it works. <laughs> how it works. <laughs> just great stories. People in the audience were like, oh. They were like looking for an example, and it was just, there's a real connectedness in that. Mm, so you feel it. Yeah. Uh, then there's No Control Over the World, talks on the Serenity Prayer, which is just fantastic. Like it's all in a nutshell, all in one CD. Yeah. And then Joy and, that's uh, Colton Gathering. I called it Joy and Clarity, the Gathering and Colton, because it's just, there's so much joy in this gathering. And, Singing too. Real this was a Course in Miracles yeah. group that sings regularly, like you would go to a church service. They sing their joy at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's yeah, and you kind of in that gathering just went through. Um, somehow it was just all laid out really clearly, just through the metaphysics. I just remember it was like, okay, step one, step two, step three, step four. It was like just really clearly all laid out. So that's those two sets. Everything's on a donation basis, so there are little cards there with suggestions, <coughs> but, um, yep, it's did all... You look at the, did you say this is the best one? Or? They're both really good. That was the first one I made up, and then that was the second, like part one and part two. Which would you think would be the best one, though? 
And then these magazines were um, our friend Raj in Australia who organises all of the gatherings. They put out this journal um, quarterly. I think it's quarterly. Yeah. I'm not sure. Quarterly. And uh, have you spoken about that? They've, they uh, they were the editors Raj and Sue's for years, and um, recently they've been having a guest editor come in, and, and basically they've said pick your topic and provide us with the material, and it's and then they they professionalise it all and do what they do. So there's uh, lots of writings in there that Jason Devine wrote one, David wrote one on divine providence. That was the theme. So yeah. That's there if you want to flick through. And again, they're on a donation basis too. They have a suggestion of a price, but they gave us a bunch of those. So Kind of an international group too. Sylvia had one in there. Gary yeah. Renard asked him to write an article. He wrote an article <laughs> in there. And you'll probably see Sylvia here one of these visits because this, this year she's from, I see a photograph of her in there, but she's from uh, Colombia and she does a lot of meditations and she's very devoted and she was talking a lot about. Australia this time. Before I left, she kept saying, I kept keep hearing Australia, Australia. So, because I think somebody was asking too, they said, are you coming here annually? And I said, well, I think of our messengers group, there probably will be uh, one or two or three or so coming probably on a, on a regular basis. Uh, as, the, as the call comes in, we just go where we're guided and so. And now one of our friends wrestles during the Starting the Peace House in Newcastle? Yeah, around Newcastle. Can I speak to that? I, um, we're, we're very, very fortunate that Raj and Australia are so generous because with the amount of support that we can manage to rustle up in, in New Zealand, we couldn't afford to pay the international airfares and, and run a retreat without piggybacking on the Australian trip. Um, so with Raj's generosity and if you thank him for us. We Actually, you and Mia got it going, though. Uh, uh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they piggyback on you. <laughs> Start yeah, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> so there was reciprocity there, wasn't there? <laughs> so we're very fortunate, and I think um, after this retreat, if you can talk to everybody you know who could be interested for next year, um, and uh, maybe get them to contact me. I'll put them on the mailing list. Tell them how you know that if we really want this to happen annually, we need, we are devoted. We're a devoted group. We want to awaken. And if anybody would like to join us, we'd love to see them. That would be tremendous. And it just means that we we can keep getting these guys back to help us on our path because it's such a blessing to have them here. Yeah. yeah, it comes in different ways too. If you know somebody who even has frequent flower models, that's how it started for me. I just went around all around the United States and Canada for quite a number of years, just by car basically, very going very spontaneously. And then in 2003, I, I met this man named David who, who had uh, won a prize. He was a world traveler and and he enjoyed traveling around the world, but he also collected frequent flyer miles, and he was on this trip, and it was like Latin American Airlines were having a contest that if you flew on these segments of these particular airlines and stayed at these hotels and resorts and ate these, this food and whatever, you could win the grand prize of a million frequent flyer miles, which he did. He won uh, <laughs> the grand prize. So. So then he had a million frequent flyer miles on Latin American airlines. And then when I met him, um, uh, two or three days before I met him, uh, we sent these free CDs, uh, the Music of Christ, to people who request them. And I put them on, on the internet on a lot of different mailing lists and groups. And some of a friend from Argentina named Pat Posada uh, basically wrote back and said, Oh, I live in a far country. and." I don't think you could afford to send me one of your free CDs, but I would love to have one. And, and so Resta wrote to her and said, I'll send you the whole set, like six or seven or whatever. So then Pat wrote back and said, uh, so happy to hear that you're coming to Argentina. 
and uh, told me about that, and I said, what did you say to her? And she said, I, well, I said, someday we'd be open to travels. But we got the invitation, and then two days later I met this man David for the first time, and, and he, he basically said, uh, have you ever thought of going overseas with any of this stuff? And I said, no, I, I never even gave it a thought. And I don't have one of those uh, thingamajiggies that you need in the passport, David. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, I, uh, I said, well, we did hear this woman that wrote two days ago and said, so happy to hear that you're coming to Argentina. And he went, Argentina? I love Argentina. Oh, I would so much love to go down there and take you along, and I could take two of your friends along, business class, uh, class all down there. I said, how, how would that be? Well, you see, I won this contest, and I've got a million frequent fire miles I have got to figure out what to do with, and I was, a couple of days ago, I was praying to God, saying, I love to go all over the world to do all these travels, but he said, I gave the million frequent fire miles to God, and said, you know, these are you to use for your purposes. And so then two days later he met me and he said, I think this is what they're intended for. So he flew four of us, Resta, myself, and Carrie, and himself uh, down Ejecutiva, that's what they call Spanish for executive first class, Ejecutiva. So that's how the international travel started. With <laughs> first class. <laughs> first class, which was good for Resta because she's... She, the one I mentioned earlier, was living a kind of a secluded life, and she would not have gone coach. <laughs> Always could do that. Had to be Hecutiba. So uh, it was good too for night space for me. I was like, oh, yeah, I can. S this international trail was not so bad. I can <laughs> like Lily Tomlin. The <laughs> little Peter Pan. You got your hook, and now this big body's got to fit in. Yeah, yeah. So. We have fun. And Jason's re he's really ready to go wherever. Give me a call teaching me. So Argentina is next. Yeah, the freaking fire miles. Yeah, the freaking fire miles. So you're still using up the million miles? No, he, he had a frequent fire mile thing that he was waiting to see where the Holy Spirit would use. So. And then they donated uh, a woman who recently visited us, bought uh, Kirsten's ticket, so that's how they're making it down there to South America. Yeah. It comes in such wonderful ways. But. So this song coming up, this is, I know you're ready for it now, I'm the Holy Child of God in Heaven. As I mentioned, a little bit of rap, hip-hop, feet, and you'll hear the Oriental uh, sounds kind of in there too, and then these lyrics that basically come from the Course. Uh, Jacob is a Course in Miracles student, so uh, he has an interlude where it's just, you can hear, he, he gets into his God voice. In you is everything already accomplished. <laughs> you know, he, I think you'll enjoy it. <laughs> like Yoko Ono and hip-hop and rap all the world ago.
century castle invited me to come and speak at this castle. They had the translators of all the Scandinavian Course in Miracles books there. And they had a night where it was talent night, they called it, where people got up and recited poetry, sang songs, did dances, did skits. Whatever. Are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. They did the whole thing. And my friend Anna picked that song out. And she was going to get up and she got all dressed up to do a, a dance to that song. And she stood out and everyone was sitting around in a circle and she got up there and she said, David, get up here with me. So I get up there and then she said, everybody. So it was like Dick Clark's American Top 40. Everybody was out dancing <laughs> to I'm the Holy Child of God in heaven. <laughs> but it's just a lot of fun, you know, when people just relax. We were together, like we'd been together over the weekend. We were together for three or four days and people just relax and enjoy meditating and walking and eating together and sharing stories and it's kind of a nice cozy relaxed kind of family in a 17th century castle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was kind of fun. Family of 60 people? Yeah, family of 60. That's where I met Jenny. Actually Jenny came, everybody had pre-registered and come but she broke the rules. She, she came in after it started and she said, can I stay? And the people said, well, okay. And then they left her stay and she was there for two hours and felt she received everything that she needed. <laughs> and yeah. so I was really, really stupid. I didn't ask if I could stay. <laughs> I had um, oh, yeah. just, um, before, but I was late. You were late. I, had, ah. I, I worked the night. And then tell the story about after two hours, you said you told yeah, the Yeah, I felt like I had uh, got everything I, I came for. Mm -hmm. It was such a message. It was just came right into my heart and I, I just, yeah, I felt, okay, I, I, I know what I came for. So I asked the, the organizers if the, well, they said I, I feel guided to, to go home. I feel like I... I got what I came for, uh, and they said, no, I think it's the ego, it's your ego that wants to leave now, <laughs> and, uh, and I just, okay, maybe they're right, because I was, I was pretty new to the course, and, and I, I didn't really trust my own intuition, so I, I listened to them, so I stayed, but it didn't feel very really good, I stayed for one day, and, and I thought, oh, well, I can go and ask David about this. 
I asked you about this. I said that I felt going to leave after two hours, and, and they said, said I should stay. And you just said, should is a word you never should use. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right use of the word should. <laughs> right. oh, wow. that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bad idea. Then I felt, I mean, then I felt like it was very, really nice to be there, but, but um, I felt a bit confused because I hadn't followed that prompt that I had earlier. So I thought, okay, maybe I need to, to do it anyway. So I, I went home, but I, all the way home I, I had this guilt. talk to myself. Mm -hmm. No, I, yeah, some guilt, but I, I, I just said to myself, okay, I, I, uh, you have the permission to, to go back tomorrow if you want mm -hmm. to, because this was a Saturday and it was one more day in this uh, retreat. So, uh, so I just felt very calm and I felt very determined to follow that because I knew I would have many thoughts in the morning that you know, they, they would give everybody think when I come back and uh, yeah, I was very concerned about what people would think. So, so I, I realized that I had to be very determined to myself. In the morning I felt, yes, I want to go. <laughs> so I took my car and, and drove this, uh, what was it, 150 kilometers. <laughs> and that was also a thing because, because uh, uh, so releasing this, I had so many thoughts about environment and I would need to use the car so <laughs> only for myself and back and forth. And, and, and after hearing David saying it, nothing is real or that, and <laughs> I, was, I was just, yeah, I was so happy and such a release mm -hmm. from all those old thoughts and ideas. And then Did I stayed for the whole course? What? Did you stay for the whole course and finish? I stayed for the, for the rest of the course, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. only one day. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. And I felt the old feelings when I came because this embarrassment to, to walk in there in front of everybody to come back there and, and uh, they had breakfast and I just walked in and, and sat down in the play table and, and you just saw me immediately <laughs> and came and had me so it was very happy. I gave her a hug and I just whispered in her ear I said the prodigal daughter has returned. <laughs> 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 yeah. And then I had another encounter. It was a, a guy there that seemed very strange because we we sat down together and talked, and, and immediately I, I got so triggered by him, irritated by the way he spoke, and he told his story over and over again to different people, and a story about the past he, he had kind of awakening experience when he was a child and he told the same story. I was so irritated and it was the first time I met him but it felt like it was something special with him. And my car, when I was going to go back after this, this course, um, my car broke and, and he lived like um, <laughs> 10 kilometers from me. So uh, I had to ask him if I could. <laughs> so he, he drew my car. We took a rope and drew my car to the station. And we left my car there. And I had to go with him in his car. What's his name? His name is Yeah, and it's with this guy, I had such a, a forgiveness lessons. Yeah. <laughs> we we <laughs> Yeah, when I found out he lived close to you, and, and yeah. you, she was saying, eh, there's nobody else near me to talk to about these things, and this and this, and I said, I think Banked lives yeah. nearby, I, think, I said, I think you should be with Banked, and yeah. she said, oh. <laughs> He's a single dad, and he has a son, and I have a son. Yeah. Lots of parallels and mirroring yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. But how 
I invited him for a retreat after, because last year I was, I was with David uh, in the United States and for three months and then I returned to Sweden and, and I felt I, I had no one to talk to, to be with because no one would understand me. I felt like I had gone through such a process and uh, I couldn't relate anymore to the people I used to and they, I didn't recognized them all, almost, and, and uh, so it felt like I had only him, and, and I felt like he isn't, I, I didn't want to really <laughs> be with him, but, but I also thought, okay, I have something to look at here, <laughs> so I invited him for a retreat, just him and me, and <laughs> it was like a thunderstorm. <laughs> <laughs> away from me and, and he just stared at me all, and he that was what he did almost all the retreat he, he was oh. so much onto me he just he didn't look in his own mind <laughs> and he just stared at me and suddenly he said after maybe one hour or so he just said do you want to have peace or do you want to be happy <laughs> and he just pointed at me <laughs> and, and I was just Furious. <laughs> was rage, and I just, I need to go, and I went out. It was the middle, in the middle of the night, and I walked out of the house. Deep in meditation. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked out of the house and into my parents' house, and they were away, so I could use the internet. So I. I wrote an email to David. <laughs> this is what he's doing. <laughs> and David answered. Was that for the ego in your ego, or the ego in, in this? And this was helpful because I could go back and I could just watch that what was happening. It's very really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there's some more. <laughs> <laughs> we even yell mm -hmm. at each other. <laughs> how, how long have you been into the cars? Hey? How long have you been into the cars? Me? Yeah. The, the, the guy? He has been, I think, 10 years or so. 10 years, yeah. And what was it that you found you didn't like? Was he... well, it was, um, it was uh, something in his personality. It was uh, his way of acting. His way of being so much on me instead of... <laughs> Right. And that triggered me many times. So when, when love comes together, it brings up all this stuff because it feels that love is, because love is being one when we are loved, when you meet somebody, it's like this chance, you have to transform it to, so it is, it does feel like hell, but yeah. like you say, it can be heaven as well. Yeah, yeah, because when I got into this forgiveness mode, and I could and forgiveness it was so helpful. It's a gift, really. Yeah. It's like, but I had to be very, very attentive all the time. Very. Mm. Could you feel he had ulterior motives towards you? Um, I think he thought he had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He had a word in us. And of course, I had too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. But we got into this love relationship too. We had powerful, even physical, powerful encounters. Mm. Yeah. But it's flashed up gates. Mm. Yes. Mm.
I'm going to hear that pray, pray because he said that the Saiti had told him that he would meet his life partner that spring, last spring. <laughs> and uh, it was when he met me. And, and that's a little stirred up for me. Please, God, don't move. She read that part of the chorus thing. Life partner could be hostile to one another, perhaps for life. <laughs> no! Oh, <laughs> just, on, just on that subject, Lynn's mother and father were continually fighting. It affected her quite badly when she was younger. But, um, not physically. Not physically, no, verbally. Uh, but the first night I was, I went home to see the family. They had they had their dining uh, table in what was a big lounge, and uh, they had a full-fledged fight in front of me as to who brought the salt in from the kitchen the <laughs> night before. <laughs> and I stood there and thought, what am I getting into? <laughs> Incredible, and, and yet they. They stayed together uh, until Bruce died, and I always said that the only thing that held them together was their arguing and their warring. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because couldn't. my mother would always rather be right than be happy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> being contrast. right is being happy to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good insight into it. What to let go of. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you have to have the contrast. Even throughout history, like Mary Baker Eddy, uh, she's really known as a, a definitely a contemporary saint who really could heal the sick, so to speak, or reached a beautiful state, a lofty state of, of, of awareness. And, and her father was like this fiery man who believed in fire and brimstone, the old way of God punishing, and uh, I saw a picture of him one time, he just had like a fire in her eyes, and so much of her life was, was a revolt against what she had experienced in him in childhood, like, like she just couldn't believe in her soul that God was that way. It was such a striking contrast that was presented to her in her biological father that it kind of the Holy Spirit will use contrast at the beginning. When you're so addicted to misery, and you're so addicted to the ego, and you're not even aware of your own addiction to the ego, then it seems in the plan that you have to have some wake-up contrast experiences. It's just like, you know, the defibrillator, you know, when they, when they put, give an electrical charge to somebody whose who's heart has stopped beating, it's kind of a drastic measure, but it's like... It's like a last-ditch effort, you know, like, we've got to get the heart going again. So, when the mind gets so enamored and allured and, and stuck in this world, then there seems to be some major contrast experiences. And Kirsten's talked about her, her head injuries, kind of like a spiritual two-by-four, whack. And then if it doesn't get you the first time, <laughs> another time. But it's such a contrast experience that after that, then it made meditating, you had more of a, a purpose for meditating and working with the Course, because it was just like the old way mm. wasn't going to serve anymore. No, it was painful. Very painful. Oh, it really like debilitating too. Just yeah. Totally, yeah. Yeah. I really showed myself that my way didn't work in a very graphic way. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of going from really headstrong and stroppy to when your wrists are broken and you have to be like little birds, you know, when little birds are in the nest, they have to <laughs> open their mouth, eat me. <laughs> it seems that's kind of a very humbling experience when you're used to being independent and doing everything for yourself. Yeah. You know, that's been a good example of one of those contrast experiences where you have to... Going from independence to dependent, literally. Yeah. yeah. Even from intellectual to like my path involves supreme intellectual like I'm going to figure this out I'm going to get it and as soon as I understand it I'm done and it was like I needed an experience that showed me it doesn't work that way so I went on this trip to Portugal with uh, three kids and their mother and um, I was just kind of like an uncle hanging out with everyone and we went out swimming to the beach 
and apparently you're not supposed to swim there. But I told one of the younger girls, 16, I said, don't go out too far. And she started swimming out. And uh, I said, are you okay? She said, yeah. She said, okay. I look again. I'm like, are you okay? She says, yeah. I'm like, try to come back in. I'm we're out, you know, maybe 30 meters. She started coming. She couldn't make it. She said, can you come get me? So I, I swim out to get her. And uh, I start pushing her in with these waves, exerting all my energy. And we're farther out. We're getting carried out to sea. I'm like, oh, that's it. All I got enough energy for is to scream. So I tried screaming as hard as I could. I could barely get my hands above the water. And uh, the mother couldn't hear the waves. There's nobody around. And I'm like, ah. I looked at her. She looked at me. Nobody knew we were out there and we were being carried out to sea. This is it. I'm like, wow, I didn't think I was going to go this way. I actually thought that was it. And we just kind of like shrugged shoulders and I was starting to go under. I couldn't breathe anymore. I'm like, well, if I'm going to live, it's up to God. I can't figure my way out of this. And right after that thought, um, as we were heading into the rocks on the other side, this surfer comes out of nowhere and picks up her and I on the boards and saves us. So right after the thought, I can't do this by myself. It's like God sends us. <laughs> Angel out of nowhere. Apparently someone far away on like a lighthouse had seen my arms waving and had called out to one of the surfers and he came as fast as he could. Mm -hmm. Picked us up, and it was a transformational experience of like surrender yeah. to the intellectual way. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. <laughs> and I laid on the beach for like five hours. <laughs> 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 Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a powerful experience because then it's like it sets you in a whole new direction of, of trust. Yeah. Whole new depth. Plus, I had the thought, "Wow, I'm done." It wasn't this sense of fear. It was like, "Oh, oh." And everything else is a bonus, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's you learn to let go of all expectations in every situation. I, there was a singer-songwriter who traveled with me, Donna Marie Carey, who we heard some of her music, I think, in the beginning, and. Uh, she had a daughter who was about maybe 10, 11 years old, and and one time Donna Marie said, "Well, my daughter would like to, and I would like to go on a little trip to you up to Michigan and to meet some friends. And can she, my daughter, bring a little friend of hers, another little girl, about 10 or 11 as well? And can we all go together?" I said, "Fine, that'd be great." And so we got in the car and we. We're driving up through Ohio, up towards Michigan, where we would stop at this uh, kind of little campground area, this lake, and swim together and so forth. And, and Don Marie's daughter was in the back seat, oh, I don't feel so good, mommy, mommy, I don't feel so good on the trip. And then, then blah, threw up all on the lap of the other little girl. You're <laughs> both sitting in the back seat, so like, <laughs> all this vomit. So I oh, pulled over to the service station and I said, come on, let's get in here, let's get you cleaned up. And cleaned up and everything. And back in the car we go drive, drive on a little bit further, we maybe go another 40, 50 miles. <laughs> okay, let's, come on, let's get you cleaned up here, you know. <laughs> clean them up, clean them up. In the back of the car. We drive another 40, 50 miles. Ah! <laughs> the cycles, the cycles, you know. And the little, the little girls like over there with a the towel, <laughs> like protecting us. <laughs> so this goes on for a number of three, four times, and I think it's we get up there. And Donna Marie, who's like a Course in Miracles teacher and singer, she's just like, oh. And so she's like, oh, just got a throbbing headache, and oh, there's all the mother concepts, and the should-haves, and the would-haves, and the could-haves, and should we even take this trip, you know, all the hypotheticals whirling around, and what could have been different, what could I have done different, and, you know, false empathy, perceiving the pain of the little girls, and all this and this, so we finally get up to Michigan, and we get to the lake, and I'm like, okay, come on, let's get our swimsuits on, and everything, and the girl's like, wee, <laughs> they ran off the chains, <laughs> And so when I got mine on, and I was like, oh, just go, <laughs> get away, you know. But it was all just 
perception, you know, it was like, oh, I didn't see a problem. And you know how kids are. They went through whatever they went through, and then they were thrilled when <laughs> we made it to the lake, you know, to get out there and go swimming. And they were jumping around in glee as if nothing had ever happened. You know, just like, you know, like animals are that way. They're just so in the moment, so. But it was just a good, uh, another good symbol about how you really just have to let go of the judgments and the roles. You only upset yourself, you only give yourself a headache or whatever, seemingly when you hang on to these judgments and roles and expectations and there's really no need in any situation, you know, to really buy the bait or to, to hook onto the problem, you know, because that's where the, the struggle comes in. Difficulty. It's great with being our kids that they love so many experiences. It is a little book, I don't know if it's only in New Zealand, there's this little book called God on a High Lake. Real nice little book. I mean, when you said about it, it was God on a surfboard. Yeah, I was with, one time I was in Indianapolis, I think, or St. Louis, maybe St. Louis it was, and giving a talk to a pretty large group of, most of them were psychotherapists. And I told the story of how one of my students one time said, Oh, David, I can't think of anything better for my two children than to um, let them, let you come up and house it and let them spend like a week with you. Uh, that would be the best gift I could give my children. And so her husband was a pilot, so we're going to fly out and go off to some resort somewhere and leave you with the kids, the house and the kids for a week. Uh, we trust you with our kids for a week and everything. It should be a great experience for them. And so they said, uh, okay, we're going to give some money in case uh, you guys want to go out to, to dinner and, you know, just enjoy yourself and have a good time with the kids and everything. And, Velocity, they flew off for a weekend. And so basically, it was a very, it was like, oh, so much play. Uh, immediately they wanted to rearrange all the furniture in the living room and draw, get uh, blankets and sheets and build like a little fort, a little house inside the house, you know, and get me down there and the play, oh, all kinds of imaginary games came out in this and this and this. And, and then, we would lost track of the time, the days, the morning would go, the day would go and everything, and then we finally get to be around dinner time and I say, what do you want for dinner? They go, McDonald's! Monday night, <laughs> Tuesday night, McDonald's! Wednesday night, McDonald's! Thursday night, McDonald's! Friday night, McDonald's! Of course, they had Playland over there, you know, just, they just, and they, as children will do, they, they will try to test out your boundaries. And they were like, oh, Dave. <laughs> they were like, they always like test to see what they can get away with. And I, I'm in a state of non-judgment. I mean, they put me on a horse one time in Argentina, and, and the Kirsten went ahead, and the guide went ahead, and my horse was going off. I was feeding the horse as we'd go along, and... If they wanted me to beat the horse or actually strike the horse, I was not. What's the point of striking a horse? I don't really care where the horse takes me. You know, so. so they were looking back, the person went off, and the guide was going off on the horses, and then they looked back, Bartolo! They were screaming at the horse, and me, David! Bartolo! Like, that we were deviants, but I'm not going to be getting a horse. I don't care what they say. So I was with the kids, and we were just having this joyful time together, and the kids were like, really loving it. Because it was like, it was non-judgment, there was no boundaries, there was no limits, and they were playing and having a good time in McDonald's every night and this and that. And uh, so at one point they got, the children got so happy, so happy, that they were what you might call giddy. They were, they were actually getting deliriously giddy, they were so happy. And I think one, the little girl, and then the, the, her brother was a couple of years younger, the little girl, Went and 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 spit. I remember I had that beard that you saw in there, so I remember just in slow motion. I could see the little goober. Flying. You could have a camera on that one. Slow motion, see the goober flying over and landing in the beard. And 
And I remember just in total joy looking at the whole thing, following it over and landing in the bed. And then, of course, they looked again to my face and my eyes to see, is this, is there anything, is this wrong or is this bad or whatever? And when I just kind of smiled back, it was like, spit bath! <laughs> so her, her and her brother was spit was flying all over the place. We all had a nice spit bath, went in, showered, and <laughs> continued on with the next game. I was telling this story to the about 30 psychotherapists who were going, they were shaking their head. I was saying, Dave, there's no sense of boundaries here. This is, this is destructive. You've just been destructive in the children's lives and all this and this. And I said, oh, no, no. I said, you have to understand what the point is. The point is non-judgment. It's re reaching a state of complete non-judgment, which, of course, Animals feel it, you know, you have animals come up to you when you're in a state of non-judgment, non-fear. Children jump in your lap, you know, they want to play. They feel connected and joined because the state of non-judgment is a natural state. Or the state of control and rules and whatever is, is, a, is an ego state. So people, they gravitate to that. So I, I told that and it helped. The psychotherapist would say, what kind of role modeling is that? You know, what kind of, you know, what were you modeling for these children and everything? I said, that's not how it works. I, we think we learn from behaviors, but really it's all telepathic. You, you have the beliefs, you have the thoughts in your mind, and then the world witnesses to you your thoughts and your beliefs. It's not like children don't really learn from the behaviors of, of their parents or their siblings. It's all going on in terms of beliefs and thoughts. There's no transfer going on in terms of, of visuals, learning, you don't really learn from behavior. So there really is no such thing as role modeling, but in fact, uh, you know, a lot of times children, that's, they feel the hypocrisy. The, the parents are making up all these rules and saying, it should be this way, has to be this way, I'm in control as long as you live in my house, it's my way or the highway, and this and that. And then the children see the, the hypocrisy of the parents breaking a lot of their own rules and then start to think, why should I follow you? Who put you in charge of me? Mm -hmm. Who says you can make up the rules? It's because you've got a bigger body. Uh, what mm -hmm. gives you the right? You know, it's the rebellion part will come out. So anyway, we had a great, great week. In fact, they had so much fun that they were like saying, Do we have to let the, the parents back. <laughs> Do we have to let them come back in the house. And, uh, but it was good because then when we got back, we had beautiful integrating discussions with the student and their husband because, you know, the children had learned so much in terms of, of being intuitive and flowing with their intuition. And, uh, and there was a time, too, where um, I took the little, the boy came down to see me in uh, Cincinnati, and we went to see this movie called Little Buddha. Uh, and in the scene, it's, there's a transformational scene where Siddhartha, goes from being a man into the Buddha. He has to face all these temptations coming at him, sitting under the Bodhi tree and facing dancing girls and, and flaming arrows and all kinds of temptations of the world. And little Matthew, he's maybe like seven, eight years old, he, he had a very strong voice, so he wanted to sit with me in the movie theater while we were watching this very metaphysical movie. And uh, Basically, his mother said, okay, you can sit with David, but you have to sit in the front row because the sound will travel. You can't be in the back talking to David in the middle of the movie. You'll disturb all the other patrons. So he sat in the front row. So did I. We sat next to each other. We're watching this movie, Little Buddha, and finally Siddhartha's there, just sitting there in the lotus position, very still, and all these temptations are coming up, and, and Siddhartha's not even moving, not in the least bit deterred by all these temptations and everything. And little Matthew's sitting next to me and he looks up to me in the middle of the movie and he, he points at the movie screen and he says, that's a powerful mind. And I said to him, yes, yes it is. So we watched more and more temptations come. Siddhartha doesn't unfaze, doesn't move anything. Little Matthew says, I will have that mind, the seven-year-old says, <laughs> he's watching the movie. And we're like, yes, yes indeed. So then we watch a little bit more of the movie, and Sid Harper's like a rock. He's not phased by anything that the world's throwing at him in anyway. good. I am that mind. I, 
Ah, yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> it's like people sometimes say that the children, you know, can't be spiritual. They've got to go through all this ego development and this and this and this. But I see the children are just symbols of, of a state of mind. So I had no parameters on the thinking of the child as a child. You know, it's just a, it's just a reflection of my mind. So in that sense, you just everything can be used for the maximum. You don't have to talk to children as if they're children. If, if you can release your mind from the belief that children are children and see that everything is a reflection of your own mind, then to that extent they can reflect back to you what you have in your mind as well. You free them you know, to be that way too. So it was a very powerful, powerful time with those, those children. We had a number of powerful experiences where we just took the parameters off. Well. Their kids can teach us tons of parents. Mm -hmm. The same little boy would, uh, he was up in Traverse City, Michigan, but basically when the ice would melt in the spring, the, the bay would be extremely cold um, because the ice had just melted in the bay. And he would go out swimming. And people would like look out like in March in this bay up in off of Michigan and they would be just like looking at him and almost in total disbelief. This little seven year old boy was out there swimming in these waters and they would actually walk up and touch the walk. Like <laughs> like, does this seem real? <laughs> but but again that was just another good sign of uh, mind over matter. You know, he was very happy and Unaffected. Uh, it just shows how you know it's, it's working on that mind training and appearances deceive, but you don't have to buy into the, the appearances. Good example. Was the parents, you know, were like the the week that there was aware um, when the parents come back? What was the relationship then? I mean, was the parents into the, the cars? Yeah, well, the, Rhonda was a student of mine and, and her husband, Tom. Um, he was open enough. He would later be open enough to having me and a group of people come up there and having like a little community in the house. So I'd say they were, they were very, very open to these ideas. And it really was very good for discernment. Like, uh, like for example, Rhonda had this thing where um, she did not feel comfortable with the children watching a lot of um, violent cartoons or violent movies mm -hmm. uh, sitting there. And everything. She was the core student. Uh, she had, had discomfort around that. And then her husband, who was not into the course, would say, what's the problem? Uh, you know, if it's all an illusion and it's all just a bunch of images, mm -hmm. why should we care of whether our kids watch these movies or not? Um, he would say, I grew up uh, watching violent cartoons all the time. Tom and Jerry, you know, the cat and the, you know, back and forth, how they would fight and fight and fight. And, she, and he'd say, look how I turned out. And she said, yeah, look how you turned out. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so then we, you know, we get deeper into the discussion. And it was, again, we'd have these discussions like, well, we have to go much deeper because she intuitively was feeling that, that their minds were not trained sufficiently and to just sit there in front of a TV with what seemed to be violent movies just didn't feel intuitively right. And so we had to, to take a look and I said, well, it's not the movies per se, but it's like, but it's like, yeah, I think it's good that you don't feel to just leave the children there unsupervised constantly watch those kind of things all day, I suggested to him then, if there's a particular movie or something that could be instructional, watch it together as a family, and let the children, with their curiosity, ask questions, and let the spirit pour through and use, if you're going to have a, that kind of a movie or whatever, use it occasionally as a teaching device where you can discuss, no different than the children see something on the news, and go, mommy, why? Why did that happen, or this and this, and, and it can be an inroads to a deeper discussion. And actually, I have a friend, Alex, who's in Sweden, who's, who's trained as a psychologist, 
And he was saying, you know, how do I work with my children? And uh, he took it really far. I mean, he would have, he's, he was going through the Course in Miracles with the three uh, children who were like five and seven and maybe 11, 11, 12 at the time. Particularly the seven-year-old. She was so tuned in. They were working the Course lessons together. And uh, at one point, I was in Sweden and I did a series of gatherings. and. Again, I was put with like 30 psychotherapists out in the woods of Sweden. They showed them the movie I Heart Huckabees, but before the gathering started, I had this little seven-year-old blonde girl, uh, Sophia, who looked like a little teeny miniature of Madonna, like a little seven-year-old Madonna, <laughs> come out and that her father had taught her this course. They made a song up from lesson number one in the Course in Miracles about nothing I see means anything. It had a nice little tune to it, and they sang it in front of this, these uh, 30 psychotherapists. And the psychotherapists were just like blown away. Then we showed them the movie I Heart Huckabees, which was very funny but very metaphysical. And that just opened the discussion up. Most of these psychotherapists weren't even, never heard of A Course in Miracles before. But by the end, they were just lit up and glowing. So it was all just orchestrated. They had this very funny movie and this little seven-year-old singing a version of lesson number one from the course, and that got them, uh, kind of hooked them into that. So the psychotherapist, that have, you know, got to have ground rules and, you know, and this, that, the children, when they was introduced to the course in miracles, it completely changed their perception. It starts to, it, it definitely puts them in that direction, you yes. know, where they, they're listening yeah. from a lot of their uh, conditioning. Uh, yeah. So when, when, when they go on um, and deal with patients, it would be totally different. I think they all, they all come, well not all of them, but a lot of therapists come from problems. And so if you're battling away at the problem, yeah. so of course in the report obviously there is no problem. So I imagine it would be much thrown for a loop because everything they're concerned with is yeah. fixing something. I think it's, it's quite interesting because my friend Alex, for example, he was trained in psychology. He and his partner Anna were psychotherapists. And the deeper they got into the course, you know, Anna was used in many ways in her counseling skills. And she was drawn beyond that. Uh, now she's working with like three, or three kids and two foster children. They both, they both were were guided by the Holy Spirit out of the whole psychotherapy field. They're no longer even in the field anymore. Uh, but they went through a series of, of ways where they were used. The Holy Spirit would come through them. And then finally, um, I think Alex got to the point where he was working with a patient and he let all this teaching come through and very rarely would he even mention the Course in Miracles in that kind of context. But the woman kept asking him, is there any additional reading, is there any additional materials and books that I could read, please, please. And so he mentioned the Course in Miracles. Well, some older psychologist uh, found out about it and they basically decided that he was in malpractice and that he should be uh, blocked, removed from the field. And uh, he initially he called me and we Skyped and he said, this is kind of like a major uh, lesson here. It's almost like I seem to be under a siege or under attack. And just even mentioning the phrase, A Course in Miracles over here. And, and they, he kept seeing it as just a forgiveness opportunity and he would meet with them, but they were very determined and it got to a point where he tried to almost kind of put up a little bit of a defense or fight and it just, nothing was happening. And so basically uh, he was guided out of the whole field. And then now he has foster children and he can read the Course and other materials and meditate at home mm -hmm. as much as he wants. And Holy Spirit guided him in a way, in a direction that he couldn't have even foreseen. Uh, but but he's there, and, and he and his partner have many many opportunities with these five children, you know, for trusting and listening, and foster children that come and go, and uh, and so it's all being used for undoing the ego. But it's sometimes the ego can get set by, well, wait a minute, I went through all this psychological training, and I thought sure I was going to be a psychotherapist, and then the the script takes a big turn in a whole other different direction. 
And if you can relax and just move with it, then you see it's it's beautiful. Everything that's happening is all part of a, a beautiful plan. But when you judge it and you think, wait a minute, this is a bad outcome, you know, how how dare they? And that's when the ego, you know, gets all stirred up. Well, if the you know, they don't move away from being a psychologist and stay within that. It's like going back to the drawing board. Um, within psychology, for example, there's, there's many... Oh, you seeming, know, the therapist. Yeah, yeah. many therapy modalities, more yeah. from, from uh, stimulus response all the way to more behavioral, all the way to cognitive therapies, and, and then I would say humanistic and transpersonal. But, yeah, they got much more into cognitive therapies, which is thoughts, changing your thinking, mm -hmm. rational, emotive therapy, and those kind of things, and then moved uh, more towards transpersonal th therapy, which is actually designed to undo the ego. It's actually a field of psychology that has recognized the great spiritual wisdoms, and that it's, it's not problem-oriented, it's actually designed to help you undo the ego. And there are many transpersonal psychologists that study the Course mm -hmm. around the world, uh, that integrate the Course into their practice. So, it's highly individualized. We were talking about that a little bit mm -hmm. earlier this morning at breakfast, that, you know, it's like, it's highly individualized on how the Holy Spirit will guide you and prompt you. So, we can't say that there's set uh, guidelines and rules that people should necessarily leave professions, switch professions, it's kind of like what uh, we were talking about with relationships. It takes a lot of discernment about staying in a relationship or moving on from a relationship. And uh, it's not something you should make like rash decisions and hasty decisions. You know, you should really pay attention to the signs and symbols and consult the Holy Spirit and not get tricked by the ego into uh, thinking you can just simply move on from a profession or a, a relationship and find relief in another haven, uh, this is like the Course is saying, there are no havens in this world. You can't find a haven from guilt on a battlefield. It would be like a war scene, you know, guns are flying, tanks, bombs and everything, and you're looking around for a haven right on the battlefield. And Jesus is saying, don't even try it. <laughs> this world, this world is like a battlefield and you need to go for the haven in your mind. Go for the haven of non-judgment. Go for the haven of forgiveness, uh, of changing your perception, where you will find safety, and you will find uh, a true haven. But sometimes people go for it in relationships. They think, oh, I just got to find me a peaceful mate. And then they get there and they go, yipes, what's this? <laughs> where did this monster come from? <laughs> I thought you were a peaceful mate. So you see how you have to go inside for for the healing and for the haven. I just feel that uh, I have a feeling coming up um, when you talk about healing. Um, I don't know if uh, we can talk about it. Yeah. Any particular thoughts? Or? Yeah, it's memories from, it was about how I, uh, uh, just, uh, I just got a memory of a particular event, how I treated my son, and also some thing from last summer when I had to care of these two other children, <coughs> when I really wasn't. Uh, in that state, there's so much going inward and you can't really take care of children. Mm. Um, but this thing with, with Victor uh, uh, was when he had, he and his friend had this place in the hair. Mm -hmm. And his friend, place? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had to go to uh, to buy something to take it out, and, and uh, I was in a hurry. And Victor was 
he often was so stubborn he didn't want to, to, to come with me. And I was good. And, and I knew that, that this uh, store would close in a particular time and I was in a hurry and I couldn't wait for him to to decide. And he was so stubborn and and <coughs> And this other mother uh, waited for me to go to buy these things. For me, it wasn't important because I, I didn't really believe it was a problem. But I had, I had believed that I was, I had to do things for others, so I had to go anyway. And I, I said to my son, I really need to go now. And you, you have to decide if you want to come with me or not. And he just cried and said, I don't want you to go. And, and he, was, he stayed in, in bed. And, and I said, OK, I'm going now. You can come if you want. And he was screaming and crying. And I went out to the car. And I felt so much guilt. And I, I went off with the car. And I didn't see that he came out running. It was raining. And, and he came out uh, without his even his clothes, and he just cried, and he ran out to, to try to, to come with me. I didn't even see him. So I went off to the car, and I was away for one hour or so. And I returned, and he was still crying, and he said, you didn't, you didn't see me, and I, I, I wanted to come with you, and you didn't see me. I just feel guilty with myself. Because I feel mm -hmm. something different. I think I hurt him. Yeah. So, and if we listen to that and you take it into the feeling of feeling guilt and how it played out and this and that, the, the trick that the ego uses is the ego wants you to feel guilty based on the form of something that you did or you think you shouldn't have done or something that you didn't do that the ego would say you should have done. So it wants the guilt to be associated with the form. And what you learn as you work more with Jesus in the Course is the guilt always comes from the thoughts. In other words, just in reliving this memory occurred a while ago, how many months or years? Two or three years. Two or three years. So, so it's a memory from the past coming up, and then the emotion is still feeling, the emotion is coming up, guilt. And also, now that I've left him. So he's over in Sweden and you're feeling guilt and so forth. So, so if you take the guilt, the guilt's not coming from any of the behaviors, as it would seem on the surface, but the guilt is coming from the thoughts of harming, of uh, abdicating on responsibility and so forth. And of all the children in the world, that this seems to be, of the six billion people, there's lots and lots of children. You have guilt around this particular child, which is called Victor. Not so much with the other children. You don't have recurring memories of guilt with other, so many other children, but it's like, and what is that based on? And if you bring it in further and further and further, you can see that it's based on the self-concept. That, that once you come to this world, you fall asleep, the ego makes up a substitute identity. And whether we're identified as father, mother, sister, brother, uh, whether we're identified as Course in Miracles student, Course in Miracles teacher, as, as uh, a Sweden, Swedish person, or New Zealander, an Australian, an American, and so on and so forth. This concept of, that's made up of, of all these different concepts becomes the false identity. And then we've got this false identity, this mask that you wear in this world. And with this mask, uh, the, this mask is very volatile. You know, it's, it's very, um, it feels unworthy. It feels like it's never good enough. And so if we pick an aspect of the mask, I would say that the aspect is, we'll use his mother. And that's another concept. 
mother is a concept, it's not a reality, it's a concept. And then when you look at that concept, uh, and it's part of an identity, then there's, there's an ideal that's attached with that, in the sense of being a good mother. You know, and there's a lot of guilt with being a good enough mother. How good is good enough? And you can pick the concept of mother, if you want to use it, or you can pick other concepts, but but the ego has made up these concepts, and they're like ego ideals, and whenever you judge yourself as not living up to the ideal, uh, the ideal of an ideal mother, or an ideal father, or so on and so forth, then that judgment is a self-criticism, a judgment, and that judgment is where the guilt is coming from, not from anything that happened on the screen. Uh, to use the example we were talking about last night, if you went to visit like a mass murderer, uh, in a prison, you know, how would you see their innocence except having to overlook everything uh, about them and seeing them as if seeing them for the very first time without a past. That's how you would see their innocence. And it's the same in this kind of thing where as long as you're identified in that concept with the self-concept of mother and as long as you hold Victor in that relationship then there's going to be guilt over, you know, did I do enough, did I do the right thing, you know, there's an evaluation that's being, that's held in with that memory, and that's where the guilt's coming from. And it's very strong, and I can think too that I need to pay him back, I owe him something now, mm -hmm. and, and when I have paid that back, then I can see, then I can let go of the concept. Yes. I remember we talked about this about a year and a half or, or a ago, and when you went back to Sweden, that's you found yourself doing trying to do exactly that, trying to pay him back, trying to be the good mother, go to the to the football games, attend the things, do the things that a normal good mother would do, and did that relieve you of the guilt? So again, we start to see that only forgiveness is going to to heal this thing. No matter how you play act, no matter how much you try to live up to the ideal, did I do enough? It's like saying to God, was that was that enough? Did I did I love him enough? Did I do well enough? Am I a good enough mother? Did I pass the? Do I get back into heaven? You know, was I a good enough mother? Was I a good enough father? Even with Course in Miracles teachers, you know, they, they get into working with the book, and is that, am I a good enough student? Did I, did I do it well enough? Did I achieve enough with it? Did I reach enough inner peace? Will you let me back into heaven? You know, as long as we have these ego ideals, which were set up by the ego, and we try to live up to those ideals, we, it's a trick. We always judge ourselves in comparing you know, the ego would say, oh, bad mother, there are many better mothers, you've been a bad mother, or fill in the blank, bad father, bad this, and it's, and it's through this mechanism of the mind of comparison that keeps the guilt in place, and uh, it's more of like an ego ideal, I mean, the concept of a mother or an ideal mother is, is kind of a, a concept that is set up by the ego that you can never fully reach and attain it. Uh, it's set up as, as, a, as a guilt trap. So to keep you... The comparison thought to keep the guilt in place, yeah. but to actually see the concept as the release of the guilt. Yeah, once you, can, once you can see the concept for what it is, and then you feel a sense of, of happiness and joy and freedom, because that's what forgiveness is, it just sees the false as false. Then you are open to receiving guidance. and. Of course, this guidance will bless the whole universe. It will bless Victor, it will bless everyone. A happy you, a guilt-free you, an innocent you, is going to be the greatest blessing for the whole universe. In fact, that will change all the relationships. How could I say that concept as it is right now? Mm -hmm. Well, what I would always do is, I, I, I see it as specialness. So, for example, when I first started traveling, with the Course in Miracles, you know, I would call home, talk to mother, talk to dad, talk to grandma, talk to grandpa. You know, I would like talk, talk, talk through, and 
And I felt still a sense of missing them or a sense of um, longing for things to be different and so on and so forth. And then I would just ask myself, gee, that's kind of interesting that I keep thinking about them. Out of the six billion people, uh, what makes this handful of people so special? Um, why are they so special and unique? Why am I so unconcerned with most of the six billion and so concerned with this few handful of people? It's because, well, there's an identity tied in. They're mom and dad, you know, that's my sister, da 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 And then I would start to take it in deeper towards uh, what is my calling. And my calling was to, was to go deep inside and just to expose this uh, self-concept that was made up by the ego. And then the more I started to travel, I started to get this feeling in my heart like that one child was all children. Uh, so, but there was no such thing as a special child. Um, and even I had students who would travel with me and miss their children and only to find that when we would go to the gatherings, these children would run up to them and it would jump and want to play with them and this and this and they started having this experience like, wow, I'm having so much fun with these children that are showing up at the gatherings. It's kind of, is the Holy Spirit trying to teach me something here? You know, it was the same extending of love, but it was like the forms were changing, even though there were still children coming. So, you start to loosen and loosen from the idea of possession, of ownership, of the idea, in the end, of my child, uh, my child, my spouse, you know, and that's what's going on. And also, it would be that, you know, when you have these opportunities to come together with Victor again, it's, <coughs> again, these golden opportunities to teach what you would learn, to let the full extent of love pour through you, but in a way that's not special, you know, it's not special to one body. I can understand to a degree where she's coming from. Years and years ago, when my children were young, I played the sport of judo and I taught judo and all that sort of thing. And um, <coughs> I had my children as well. And we used to have uh, the children's uh, class. I used to teach them and they were easy for seniors. And uh, <coughs> my children were playing with other children and our um, venue was a big football grandstand and we were way up in the top of it. And uh, <coughs> one night my, my son uh, was playing with the other kids. And he fell off the grandstand. And uh, he uh, ended up in the hospital one with a fractured skull. And uh, it wasn't expected to live. Anyway, he came through all right eventually, and um, it, ch it seems to change him. And uh, I think I've carried the guilt of that all my life, because I wasn't actually there for them. Good way to get this little bit, thank you so much. Anyway, um, <coughs> he, he's, he's alive now, um, with, um, with, married with five children. And he has a very, very bad depression problem. And uh, I have probably overcompensated for years. And I've always been there for him. I've always been there for everybody. You know, I invented, invented the whole thing. Anyway, I've always been there for him, probably more than anybody else. Probably because I uh, felt guilty. And. Um, he has a, a very big depression problem, and he's often spoken to me about it, and said he's, you know, felt suicidal at times, and he's in this very, very, very big dark hole. And he has a, he has a, has a job and all that sort of thing. He's a very nice person, like a gentle giant, but even I have probably carried this guilt all my life, wondering if it was my fault that he did this. and. Um, I can sort of see that, you know, 
really wasn't my fault. And there was nothing I could probably do about it. Um, so I can see where you're coming from to a degree. But you know, I don't see that you, know, you have anything to um, feel guilty for. You said one very helpful thing that you, you were there for him, probably because you were so guilty. Yeah, well, I, I did. I felt guilty and felt mm -hmm. guilty all my life. Yeah. And, um, you know, th there's nothing I can do about it, but I have to keep giving it up and giving it up. But it has affected uh, some aspects of my life. Yeah, those, th those recurring thoughts, could, could it have been different? Could it have yeah. been prevented? Yeah. And if, if you really trace those in, it's like, you know, could I have been a better father? Oh, yeah. You know, that's that's underneath it. Yeah, and that's what, what I mean with these ego <clears throat> ideals. When, I, I mean, one time I was talking with a group up in Michigan, and um, we were getting into this concept of guilt, and people were just all saying, a whole room full of people saying, how can we be free of this guilt? It's, it's deep, it runs so deep, it's so intense, how can we ever be free of it? And I went around the room, and I said, okay, I want you to all tell me uh, what you feel guilty for. And um, there were people talking about guilt around their children, the way they raised their children, guilt about not paying back money to friends and people that they owed, uh, guilt about various uh, mistakes that they'd made, judgments, and so on and so forth. And I went around the room and listened. It was like a, a guilt parade. Everybody was pouring out all the stuff that they felt so guilty for. And in the meantime, saying, help us, uh, we're carrying this burden of guilt, you know, it's a very heavy burden to carry through life. And so I said, okay, now, we went around the room, I said, now that you've poured out all these things you feel guilty for, um, can you take it from the specific event that seemed to occur, uh, to what is the role that you were playing? What, what is or what are the roles that you're playing? And they've talked about, you know, a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a citizen. They talked about all the roles that they were playing that was tied in to these events. And I said, can you see a way that you could be completely innocent and completely guilt-free and still maintain the roles? And they all went around and said, no, we can't. <laughs> I said, very good. <laughs> this is a setup. This, this world and these roles and these guilt feelings are all a setup by the ego to keep you from really experiencing love and true happiness and joy. It's a big setup. It's like a big giant game that was set up to maintain guilt. That's why the world was made. God didn't create this world. And I've heard people for years, they say, David, love makes the world go round. And, well, it sounds kind of nice, but actually guilt makes the world. Guilt drives this world. This world is egos. When people say, I'm afraid of, I'll go to hell, I said, look around you. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's going to get worse than this? <laughs> you know? It's like you've, the ego has generated a world of guilt. Guilty relationships. I could have done better. I, I didn't live up to my parents' standards. I didn't live up to my own standards. I didn't make the grade, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I wasn't a good enough mother, I wasn't a good enough brother or sister or father, I wasn't a good enough worker, I cheated on this, I wasn't a good enough spouse. You know, it's like a setup that the ego has set up to keep the mind trapped and feeling guilty. And what you start to realize is you will try to overcompensate, and that doesn't even work. You know, those emotions, well, here you are Bill, and here you are, Jenny, you're still feeling those tremors, those guilt tremors still coming up, and even when you try to overcompensate and be an extra good dad or an extra good mom, that doesn't alleviate the guilt either, because the, the idol, the, the ideal is still held in place, and the, and the comparison is still going on, and that's what's generating the guilt. So we're getting, and if we bring it back to what we've been talking about over the weekend, we're back to those private thoughts again. You can see in the movie last night, Ed TV, the guilt in the mother, the guilt in Ed, the guilt in the father, you know, it was playing out. 
the guilt of the sister, you know, when, when uh, Ed's brother got on TV and said, what was she doing in a bar anyway? For Christ's sake, she's an alcoholic! You know, right on national television, you know. It was all this guilt based on all these private thoughts. And then we come back to the teaching of Jesus. Huh. These private thoughts are not real. You've been identified with these private thoughts, and it's been hell. You've been experiencing guilt and pain.